everyone. So in this video, I'm going to go over the PowerPoint on basic APA format, what you need to know. Now, I know a lot of students um, are intimidated by APA format. Either they've really never used it, so they really don't know much about it, or they have had to use it, but never really learned what it was or it wasn't explained in a way that um, stuck with them. So I want to take a little bit of time here to just introduce you to APA format um, to kind of ease some of those worries and anxiety that you might be experiencing. Okay, um, so that's what we're going to do. So first things first. APA stands for the American Psychological Association. They are the ones that create and maintain APA format. There are a lot of other formats that you could choose from. There's MLA format, which many of you possibly used, um, especially in high school and maybe even in other college level courses. There's also Chicago, um, there's a few others that can be used. APA is just one type of formatting for professional papers, all right? Um, it's commonly used in social sciences. I mean, obviously it's created by the American Psychological Association. There's physical sciences that use it, medical fields, technical fields. It's probably more widely used than anything else. Um, and yet, many students go through high school only learning MLA, um, which is really only used in humanities classes like English and literature, maybe philosophy, things that deal with really old sources. <laughs> and that's why these types of fields like the social sciences, physical sciences, medical fields, technical fields, the reason they don't use MLA is because those fields are typically concerned with sources that are much more current, right? When I'm writing a, a, a graduate paper on Shakespeare, I have hundreds of years <laughs> of, of research to go through, and it's all relevant to what I'm writing about. It doesn't matter if it's an article that was written 70 years ago. It's still part of the discussion on Shakespeare. So MLA doesn't really care when a source was written, when it was published. We don't really care how recent it is. But in these other types of fields that use APA format, the information is changing and updating so rapidly that it's really important that we use sources that are also current and up to date. So the social sciences, physical sciences, healthcare fields, technical fields, they all use APA because, as we'll see when we talk further about APA format, one thing APA format does is it highlights when a source was published. So that's one of the main reasons why APA gets used so widely um, in so many fields is because it, it makes sure that you let your readers know that the sources you're using are current and up to date. All right? Um, but don't be afraid of it. No one expects you to memorize everything about APA format. Uh, now, I mean, if you start taking classes where you're using it on a regular basis, there will be some things that you start to remember and you won't need to look up anymore. But for now, don't feel like you're supposed to already know any of this. Um, although it would be nice if we did learn it in high school and came to college with a better understanding of it. But don't feel like you have to, to, to know everything about APA format, even if you have learned about it and used it in the past. Don't feel like you ha you're supposed to remember everything. Um, that's not how it works. There's so many elements to the formatting that, you know, no one's expected to memorize it. What 
is important is to have a general understanding of it, what it's all about, and to know where to go <laughs> to find answers to any questions you have about APA format. That's really the key. Um, so this lesson is going to give you a general understanding of APA format, and I'm going to, um, not just this lesson, meaning this PowerPoint, but our whole lesson this week on APA format, you're going to learn about it, hopefully get a better understanding of it, and then you're going to have some resources given to you that you can use anytime for this class, other classes, it, at any point in time, you can go to these resources and find answers to your questions about APA. All right. Um, so what this PowerPoint is going to do is go through the two things that really sort of define APA format, the two elements that the formatting affects the most. And that is the design elements, literally how the essay looks visually, and how you treat your sources in the essay. That's what we're going to look at. All right. Um, on slide three, you'll see a note. <laughs> um, so if you have learned about APA format in the past, it's very likely that what you used, um, the rules that you followed, were from the sixth edition of the APA Style Guide. As it turns out, um, APA published the seventh edition of their style guide in the fall of 2019. There are some slight differences between the sixth and seventh editions, of course. <laughs> we are going to learn about the seventh edition, the newest. So just keep in mind, if you take classes down the road and are asked to use APA format, um, your instructors might still be going off of the sixth edition. Um, so I'm going to give you, uh, at the end of the power, well, actually it's not at the end, but I'm going to talk about APA.org during this lesson. And if you go there, it will show you the differences between the sixth and seventh editions. Um, but first you would probably want to just ask your instructor, um, you know, be like, hey, you know, are you wanting us to go by the old sixth edition or are we okay to use the formatting rules for the newer seventh edition? Okay. If they say, well, I'm not really familiar with the newest edition yet, so let's stick with the sixth edition, then you can go to APA.org and see what some of those small differences are. It is not going to affect how you write the essay itself. It's not going to have any effect whatsoever on how you do the research and how you write the essay. There will just be some small differences in how you format the title page, maybe um, a little bit on the reference page, but for the most part, that's where the, the slight differences come into play. It will not affect the essay hardly at all. All right, so don't let it concern you too much if you come across an instructor who wants you to use the sixth edition. Much of what you're going to learn here in this lesson will still apply, even if you're using the older edition. All right. Another note on slide four <laughs> is um, that this one difference between the seventh edition um, and the sixth edition is that there are different requirements for student submissions versus professional submissions that are intended for publication. So we're going to be learning about the requirements for student submissions. That's what we're doing here, right? But again, if there's ever a time where you need to use the, the formatting for a professional submission, you can go to APA.org and it shows you exactly what needs to be done for that as well. And again, it's really not going to affect the essay itself much at all. It's just those design elements that are a little different if you're preparing it for publication. Okay, so we're going to talk first about the design elements of APA, the visual quality, <laughs> how it looks. And there are several areas that we're going to look at more closely. The margins, 
the spacing, the font, the page numbers, the title page, the headings and the subheadings, and the references page. Now, you might notice that there's two things not listed there on slide five, two things that I didn't just mention, that you may have had to include if you've ever done an APA paper in the past. And that would be the running head and the abstract. Well, in the seventh edition, student submissions are no longer required to have a running head up in the top and you are not required to have an abstract. So those are not on our list. The running head is kind of cool because <laughs> it's always problematic for a lot of students to figure out how to get it exactly right and get the page number right. It can be uh, a little tedious. Um, but we don't have to worry about that for student submissions. Now again, if you're doing a professional publication or if you have an instructor who wants it done the way a professional publication would, then you'll have to go to APA.org and see what needs to be in that running head. But for us, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about an abstract. But we're going to look at each one of those design elements that you are required to have still. So the first one on slide six, actually we're looking at the first three, margins, spacing, and font. So the margins for your essay in APA format are one inch margins on all four sides. So one inch from the left, one inch from the bottom, one inch from the right, one inch down from the top. One inch margins all around. If you're using Microsoft Word, that should be the default margin anyway. Spacing. The entire document should be double spaced. If you are unsure how to truly double space something, um, please let me know. Uh, some students think that double spacing means hitting the enter button twice in between their lines. And that's not true double spacing. And it can actually cause a lot of really weird problems if you try to do it that way. So if you're not sure how to double space, let me know. But the entire document is double spaced from the title page all the way to the very end. Also, there are no extra spaces, right? Especially when you were talking about the essay itself, once you start your introductory paragraph all the way down to your concluding paragraph, there are no extra spaces anywhere. You should always be hitting your enter button one time to go down to the next thing. That's it. References page where all your sources are listed, no extra spaces there either. Okay. Now, the font. Um, many instructors will probably still require Times New Roman 12 point font. That has sort of been the standard for many years. Um, not too long ago, they, they kind of threw in Arial 12-point font and Calibri 11-point font. Um, and some instructors might say those are acceptable as well. Always go by what the instructor requires. And if they don't put it on the assignment, ask first. <laughs> Um, if they say just follow APA guidelines, well now APA says the, that the fonts are much more inclusive. Um, there's so many different word processing programs nowadays that APA has decided to allow for a variety of fonts. Um, but they do have some recommendations. Um, either to use a sans serif font like Calibri, Arial, um, the Lucida sans, um, or serif fonts like Times New Roman, Georgia, um, what was the other one? Oh yeah, Computer Modern. Um, so there's a few more options that you have. But you want it to follow two rules though. You do want to make sure that you choose a legible, reader-friendly font style and size. You are not going to go below 11 and you're not going to go above 12 in terms of the size, right? So either 11 point or 12 point. If you go lower than 11, it's going to be too small and hard to read. And if you go bigger than 12, it's going to get obnoxious. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, some students try to use bigger fonts to reach their page limit faster. And that, that 
that, that never works. Instructors know exactly what's happening. Um, but it also just gets, it, it, even though you think that the bigger the font, the easier to read, but you reach a certain point and it's actually not easy to read. So that 11 point and 12 point window there, that's where our eyes are happiest <laughs> when we're reading um, either on hard copy or on the screen, okay? Um, the other rule to follow is use the same font throughout the whole essay. Don't change back and forth amongst fonts. Whatever one you decide to start with, that's the one you need to use throughout the whole thing, right? All right, so the next two design elements we're going to look at are the page numbers and title page. So your page numbers go in the top right corner of your header just the page number, not your last name, not your, the title of the essay, nothing else, just the page number in the top right corner of the header. The title page should be page one. It should, it should, you should see the one up in the top right corner on the title page, okay? And every page of the document gets paginated. Every page should have a page number. The title page. Um, so you'll have the page number one up in the top right corner, and then you know you'll click into the document to start typing. You'll hit the enter key like four times to bring your cursor down a little bit, and then you're going to center the cursor, right? So you're going to center it, and then in bold you are going to type the title of your paper. No special, don't, don't change the font size or anything like that. All you're doing is just putting it in bold, right? Then you're going to hit enter twice and get out of the bold face. So now we're just in regular. And after you hit enter twice, you're going to type your name. Under that, your school's name. Under that, the course number and name, under that, the instructor's name, and under that, the assignment due date. We're going to look at an example of a title page in the next lesson when we look at a sample APA essay. Um, so you'll see how that looks visually, but just know that that's the information that you're going to need to include on the title page. And that's it, okay? No author note, nothing else, just those six things. Centered, one extra space between your title and your name, no extra spaces between everything else that comes after your name, right? Okay. The next design element we're going to look at are the headings and subheadings, right? So APA uses a five heading system to separate parts of papers. So you have level one, level two, level three, level four, and level five. I'm not going to get into what each exact level is and how it should be formatted um, because you probably won't really use very many of those levels. You will always use level one, right? Centered, bold face for your title at the top of your essay, right above your introductory paragraph, right? It's possible that that's the only level you'll, you will need. It might just be that you center your title and then you start typing your introductory paragraph and you just go all the way to the conclusion, especially for you know classes where you're, you're writing smaller research papers. Now, it is possible though that you might um, have sections to your essay, like you've broken it up into sections. In that case, you would have several level ones throughout the essay. Maybe some level twos, you never know. Um, but I would say for a lot of the papers that you'll write um, in your program, uh, and this class included, um, you probably won't go past level one. But on the other side, <laughs> on the, the slide there, I do show you what it would look like if you had multiple levels. So like your title or like your first section method, right? It's centered and in bold. Level two is, so what's the first section of your methods? The site of the study. 
and then the next section is participant population. But you actually have two groups of participants that you want to describe. So you go to level three for teachers and level three for students. Then you come to the next section. After you discuss all the methods, you're going to talk about the results. So you come back to level one, right? And then you, your first set of results are special ability, and you're going to talk about test one. And in test one, you're going to talk about teachers with experience and teachers in training. And then the next type of special ability you're going to look at is what happened in test two. And then the next part of your results is kinesthetic ability. So it's just a way to visually let your reader know how each section of the essay fits together. But again, you, you may not have any sections, and that's probably okay. Um, if you're unsure, ask the instructor. I know for my class, it's I'm not going to require uh, any thing beyond level one, right? If you want to break it up into sections, uh, you know, you can do that, but it would all still be on level one. If you want to get crazy and see if you want to go into sub subsections, you can do that, okay? Um, but if you're ever in a position where you have to write a, a research paper in APA format and the instructor requires you to have these different sections and subsections and subsections of the subsections, this is how you would format it, right? Okay, the next design element we're going to look at is the reference page. We're going to look at where it's located, how it's formatted, and what it contains. So, the reference page. It is located on the page immediately after your conclusion. So let's say you're on page five, right? And you're getting down to, towards the end of page five and you're typing your concluding paragraph and like the last two sentences of your concluding paragraph go down onto page six. So page six only has two sentences up at the top and all of this blank space underneath. Nothing goes in that blank space. Don't start your reference list in that blank space area. Your references should start on page seven in that case, right? So it always starts on a new page following the end of the essay. It still requires a page number, just like all the other pages, okay? How is it formatted? You'll have the word references centered at the top of the page. The whole thing will be double spaced, just like the rest of the essay, and there are no extra spaces between your source entries. All of your sources will be arranged alphabetically according to the first word of each entry. They are not numbered. They are arranged alphabetically according to the first word of each entry. Most of your entries, the first word is going to be an author's last name. You might end up using a source or two, though, that doesn't have an author associated with it. APA format will tell you what that entry should begin with. Then. More than likely, it'll be the title of the article or the title of the web page. But you'll figure out how that entry should be formatted and what goes at the beginning if there's no author. So then you look at what the beginning word is and you use that to figure out where it goes in the list alphabetically. Okay. Any entry that uses more than one line of text, so you're typing your entry and it comes down to the next line. Any entry that has more than one line of text requires a hanging indent. It's like the opposite of a paragraph. You know, when you start a paragraph, you hit the tab key once, and it brings the first line of the paragraph in a little bit, and then you start typing, and all the rest of the sentences come back out to the left margin. A hanging indent is the opposite. The entry is going to begin all the way to the left, and every other line of that entry is indented. Five spaces. We're going to look 
add a reference page as well when we look at the sample APA essay, so you'll get to see what all of this looks like, okay? Now, what does your reference page contain? Well, it contains your references. It contains your sources. It is a list of all sources used or referred to in the essay. Every source that you use in the essay must appear on the references page. It has to. Conversely, every source that's listed on your references page must be cited or used at least once in the essay. If you have a source listed on that reference page, but you didn't actually use any information from it in the essay, it does not belong on the reference page. It has to go. If there's information somewhere in the essay that you used from a source, and that source isn't listed on your reference page, you need to add it in, okay? Very important. Each entry for each source contains all the information that a reader would need to go find that source for themselves. So if you used an article um, from some you know, medical journal, the entry on your reference page is going to include the author's name, if there was one, which is a medical journal, there will be an author, when it was published, what the title of the journal is, probably what the volume and issue number are, probably the page numbers. If you read it online, it'll even have the URL for that article. Um, and again, you don't have to memorize or know exactly how any of this should be formatted. There are ways that you can figure out what the entry should look like. But it contains all the pertinent information so that readers can go read that on their own if they want. Different types of sources will require different entry formatting. So a physical book that you can hold in your hands and read will have a little bit of a different formatting than a journal article that you read online. The differences are sometimes very slight, but you want to make sure that you're doing it the right way. There are quite a few websites out there that will create a, cita a reference entry for you. You can even use the reference function in Microsoft Word to help you create the reference entry. You'll just plug in all the information. It'll ask you what's the author's name and you type it in. When was it published? You type that in. What's the name of the journal? You type that in. It, it, it will ask you for specific information and you just plug it in, hit enter, and it will provide you with the reference entry. You can just copy and paste it onto your reference page. Um, but just make sure that you're telling it what type of source it is. Make sure that you are indicating that it's a book, a hard, a print book, or an e-text a journal article that's online, a website with no author, a blog post, blah, blah, blah. Whatever type of source it is, that will determine how the entry is formatted on the reference page. Again, you are not supposed to have any of that memorized. You can go look at a template on the Purdue Online Writing Lab or on APA.org in a handbook that you might have from an English class, and it will show you this is how it's formatted. And you can even type it out yourself just to make sure it's 100% correct. It'll tell you, put the author's last name first, then a comma, then the author's first name, then a period, then in parentheses, put the year of publication, and then a period. Like, it'll, t it'll show you exactly how to format it. So you can do it manually like that, which should guarantee that it's pretty accurate. Or you can use the other resources that are available to you to help you create the reference entry. It's not cheating. It's what we all do, <laughs> right? Um, but just know that each type of source is formatted a little differently. Don't just try to do all of them the same. All right. The first word of each entry 
on your reference list should match up with what goes in the parentheses of your in-text citations. Now, that leads us to our next element of APA format, which are your citations, the treatment of your sources. This is the other way in which APA format has an effect on how you write the paper. And it's really just tr how we're treating the sources. You can use information from a source in three different ways. You could either summarize the information from that source, and so if it's a five-page article, you're just summarizing the whole article. Or maybe you're paraphrasing. Maybe you're just taking one little paragraph from that article and you're paraphrasing it, putting it into your own words. Or maybe you're using a direct quote, word for word, in quotation marks, from that source, a sentence maybe. Those are the three ways that you can incorporate source information into your essay. No matter how you do it, though, no matter which of those three ways you use, if you have taken that information from a source, you always provide a citation in that exact spot of the essay. And the citations are what go, are, are the parentheses. We've all read enough articles and textbooks to, to know when we see those parentheses after a quote or something that the author has shared from a source, those parentheses appear immediately after that source information is used. And that is what a citation is. We provide those citations for two main reasons. The first is to let the reader know that that information came from a source, but it's not your own ideas or your own words. We also provide the citations so that to let the reader know how to find that specific source on your references page in case they want to look it up and read the whole thing for themselves. So as I just mentioned, the last thing I mentioned about the references page is that the beginning of each entry for each source should match up to what is in the parentheses in your citation. Because if your entry on your reference page begins with the author's last name, the author's last name is what will be first in the parentheses for the citation. So that way the reader can be reading that paragraph of your essay. You give a quote from that source Right after that quote, you have the citation with the author's last name, Smith, 2019. Smith, okay, let me flip to their reference page, da 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 da, -da. Smith. Oh, here's that source. Now I can go find that source and read it for myself. That's how they match up. The other part that goes in the parentheses is the year of publication, because as I mentioned in the beginning, APA format the fields that use APA format are very concerned with how current and up-to-date the information is. So if you have quoted information from a source and you give that citation, not only do you provide the beginning of the reference entry so that they can find that source easily, but you also provide the year it was published to let them know that this is current and up-to-date information. That way they know you got reliable sources. If you're talking about a topic that changes all the time, that new research and new information is being discovered on a regular basis, and you're using a source that was published in 2001, <laughs> uh, your readers might not trust that information anymore. You want to let them know, no, this is current, this is up to date. That's why we put the year of publication in the parentheses as well. Okay. Oftentimes, as I said, a reference entry for a source will begin with an author's last name. That's what goes in the parentheses along with the year of publication. So, like I showed you on slide 11, if the source's reference page entry begins with an author's last name, 
then that last name will go in the parentheses with the year of publication. For example, Smith, comma, 2019. If the source lacks an author, the reference page entry will probably begin with the title of the source, in which case the title will go in the parentheses for your citation. If the entry starts with the title, how to tie, how to tie a tie, that's what you're going to put in the parentheses for your citation. How to tie a tie, comma, 2019. There are other scenarios where what goes, you know, what goes in the parentheses for your citation will look different. It, but that'll all depend on how the entries formatted, how, how it begins on the reference page. Um, and there are so many resources available to you to figure out how that entry is formatted. So the best tip that I can give you to make sure that you are doing your in-text citations correctly is do the reference entry first. You don't have to have it in the as part of the essay, the document yet. Start another document, another file, and just list just list all the reference entries for the sources that you're using. Each time you you use a source when you're typing the essay or typing your draft, make sure that you have a reference entry created for that source. You're already going to know then how that entry begins, and you're already then you're going to know what to put in the parentheses for your citation. It's that it's re, it actually is that easy. Students get confused about what to put in the citations because they haven't done the entry yet, so they don't know what goes in the parentheses. So, if you know, I am definitely using information from this article in my essay. Create the reference entry for it. Just do it, have it there, already done. When it comes time to actually make the references page at the end of your essay, you can just copy and paste those entries onto the reference page, but have them somewhere already formatted so that you know exactly how that entry begins, what the year of publication is, so you know right away what to put in the parentheses in your citation. If you do that, it will save you so much headache. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy how that one simple step can save you time and frustration down the road. Create the reference entry first. Then you have everything you need to do your citations the right way, and you'll already have all the entries that you can just copy and paste onto your reference page when it's time. My biggest piece of advice for you. So, in review, APA is just one way of formatting a research paper. The two main areas that APA affects an essay is in the design elements and how we treat the sources. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter what format you use, you will always be required to cite your sources. How you cite it will differ depending on which format you use, but that is a rule across the board. Anytime you use information from a source, whether you've sum summarized it or paraphrased it or taken a direct quote, it doesn't matter. If those ideas, if those words came from a source, you have to give credit to that source. And if you don't, it's considered plagiarism. There is a whole other lesson on plagiarism this week, so we will talk more about that then. But you have to provide the, the, you have to give the credit no matter what format you're using. So don't let that intimidate you. APA format just says, okay, here's how we're going to cite that source. Here's what's going to go in the parentheses in our essays. That's it. Don't let it intimidate you. You don't have to memorize APA format, but know where to go if you have questions or need help. I have already mentioned APA.org and the Purdue Online Writing Lab. 
I will talk more about both of those websites plus some additional resources in the useful APA info lesson that comes a little later this week in this module. But if you have any questions about APA format in general, let me know. Otherwise, go to the next lesson after this one where I go through a sample APA essay with you and now you're going to get to see all of this stuff in action and I'll go through all of it with you in the essay and then if you still have questions definitely reach out to me.